uh, Diana with just let me start with kind of a a question about context in which this Biden visit is happening because it's not happening in a vacuum. Um, as you know, just in reference to the recent piece you wrote, an American, a Palestinian American journalist was just killed. Um, there is a push for normalization ties with Israel in the region that the Biden administration is pushing for. And then there's a lot of messiness happening in Israeli politics and American politics for that matter. Um, can you set the context for this Biden visit and how you view it? Thank you very much, Hamad. Uh, thanks for hosting this. And thank you for those who are attending. And a special thanks, of course, to my fellow co-panelists. Um, it's a delight to be with you today. In terms of the context, Omar, I think it's important to, to put Biden's visit in the proper regional and political context, which is to say that President Biden has made it clear that he isn't taking a different position from the position that President Trump has had taken in his years in office. Now, I don't say this lightly. I say this with, uh, with, with the full weight and full understanding of the words that I'm saying. And I say this because since President Biden has taken office, although he indicated that there was going to be a sea change shift in US policy from the Trump administration and to, to the current day, we actually haven't seen that sea change happen. To the contrary, we've seen that the, the embassy, which was illegally moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, has now been firmly cemented as being in Jerusalem. It's also actually just come, it's come to light that it, the new embassy is going to be built on stolen private Palestinian land. The second thing is that we've seen that the consulate, a consulate which served um, millions of Palestinians, the American consulate that was in Jerusalem, again, has not been reopened, even though there were indications that they were going to reopen it. We haven't seen a scaling back in terms of, um, in terms of the pronouncements when it comes to the Golan Heights. We haven't even seen that there's been pressure brought to bear when it comes to Israel, when it comes to settlement activity and home demolitions. To the contrary, the Biden years have been actually the highest years of, of Israeli settlement growth and Israeli home de demolitions of Palestinian homes. Now add to this the fact that we're now seeing that the big uh, push that President Trump had during his years in office was normalization. He decided very quickly to sideswipe Palestinians, to ignore Palestinians completely, and to go down a path of having normalized relations with, let's be clear, with dictatorships that were in the, the uh, Arab Middle East. And, uh, and Biden, far from stepping back from this, instead of pushing for there to be um, there to be a carrot and stick, he's given all of the carrots to Israel by once again pushing for this normalization bit. And we see this by the fact that there's going to be a direct flight from, uh, from Tel Aviv to Jeddah. Now to add to all of this is the fact that this isn't just happening, it's not just a normal visit, this isn't just about Iran, this isn't just about normalization, but we've seen just this year alone that, that practically every day Israel has killed a Palestinian for almost every day since the start of the year. And among those that Israel has killed, two of them have been US citizens. We saw that Israel killed an 80 year old in January, a man by the name of Omar Assad, who was an American citizen. And just two months ago to this very day, we saw that Israeli, uh, that Israeli forces killed Shirin Abu Akleh, a Palestinian American journalist. In both of those instances, and I know Haggai will speak more to this, we've seen that there's been an attempt to whitewash and to ignore this killing and to sweep it under the rug. The basics that one would expect of having a real investigation where we see that there, there could be um, US weaponry that's involved, where we, could, where we see that there is unbridled US support, the basics haven't been conducted. Everything from not informing the family of of who was conducting the investigation, not telling the family that they were turning this over to the Israelis, um, to then very quickly just adopting the Israeli narrative and tossing this sort of word salad that somehow they believe that this was fired by Israeli army positions, but not intentional. I'm still left perplexed as to how it is that a person can be shot 
wearing a flak jacket, wearing a helmet, and in that very spot on her head where the flak jacket and the, and the helmet do not meet. This to me sounds very intentional, looks very intentional. And the fact that this, that this administration has gone to great lengths to sweep this under the rug is definitely sending yet another signal, yet another sign to Palestinians that not only do our lives not matter, but our issues of freedom, our demands for freedom, our demands for dignity, our demands for equality will forever be met with, with uh, will ever fall, forever fall on deaf ears. And that this administration, like the administration that preceded it, is going to turn a very, is going to turn a blind eye to everything that Israel is doing, but not just turn a blind eye, actually continue to give um, support to Israel. So I'm gonna stop it there because I know that Haggai has a, a lot more to say on the investigation given that Beth Salem has done um, a great deal of work on this. Thank you, Diana. And just to your point about this looking intentional, there have been multiple media um, investigations into this and the one that was conducted by CNN really showed compelling evidence that this is a targeted killing given that it was a sniper and the, where the bullets basically were landing all in a very, very concentrated area as well, um, you know, on, on Shireen and around her. Um, I just, uh, Haggai, to pick up where Diana left off on this specifically, and sort of also more broadly on the question of um, what Diana referred to as all the carrots that the U.S. gives to Israel, and that being the general posture um, from the U.S. for a very, very long time beyond just this administration, and frankly, but it's, it's still worth talking about in the context of this administration, of the uh, extent to which this policy continues in spite of the fact that your organization among many leading human rights organizations around the world have said that Israel is practicing apartheid and that seems to have not budged American policy at all. Um, do you mind just taking a dive on that as well as the Shireen investigation? Yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you for having me and I'm happy to share this virtual stage with, with my colleagues and thank you for those that are attending and, and listening. Um, I think maybe the first thing to be said is that, that, that just like to spell out the level of frustration and, and rage and and even though the hopes were slim, but also I, I would say in fairness also the disappointment that um, but if we're looking at uh, you know two major trends, one is you know the promise of this administration to be a departure from the previous one but instead of it becoming a continuation of it in so many horrific ways, uh, that weighs heavily. Uh, on, on, on everyone, especially on, on the people on the receiving end of, the, of this injustice, the, the Palestinian people. Uh, and also to notice uh, the growing distance between the US formal position and where the entire human rights community is, you know, which goes right to, to your question, Omar, because this has been, I mean, obviously Palestinian scholars and organizations have been make, taking this position for quite some time, but if we look for the, just the developments over the last you know, year and a half or so, since you know, January 2021, then you had you know, B'Tselem, UN Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the UN Special Rapporteur. So by this point in time, what we have is this wall-to-wall -wall consensus in the human rights community, Palestinian, Israeli, international organizations, all coming to the same conclusion, that the situation is apartheid and it needs to be addressed as such, which is a different take on reality than the you know, untethered uh, from facts worldview that has been around for, for decades, that in fact what we're looking at is two separate regimes, a temporary occupation and a democratic state of Israel, and this needs to be somehow addressed in the future, uh, and often this would be married to what would be uh, framed as a, as a two-state solution. Uh, and yet here we are today, uh, where you know, anyone with, you know, the functioning set of eyes and ears will just look at reality and, you know, admit that it is what it is, a one-state reality in which Jews enjoy supremacy anywhere between the river and the sea, and Palestinians are at best second-class citizens, uh, and in many cases treated much worse than that, depending on, you know, the various variations of less, but nowhere an option of equal that Israel provides to half of the people it controls, the Palestinians under its control. Uh, and, and yet to see that, you know, the talk about future negotiations uh, and, and, and that kind of stuff is, is still, you know, front and center uh, and being, you know, so happily digested 
uh, and for some reason seriously taken, although obviously it's just, you know, I, I wouldn't even dignify, by, by this point in time, I wouldn't even dignify it by calling it lip service because it's even more shallow than lip service, right? There is no option for negotiations. The reality is going exactly in the opposite direction. US administrations, previous ones, and the current one are continuing to underwrite this in numerous ways. Uh, and if they feel that they need to like, you know, appease, I'm not even sure who by this point in time, then all that it takes is we don't just throw out these empty slogans about future negotiations. Uh, and in the meantime, <clears throat> It's not just that the reality is going in the opposite direction. In the meantime, Palestinians are being killed day in and day out, exactly as Diana has said, and they're being killed with impunity. So I'll just you know, say that and then I'll wrap up, just to point out that the, the impunity that Israel is most likely going to enjoy also for the killing of Shirin Abakler, that is you know, part of the blanket impunity that Israel has been used to enjoying for, for so many years. Uh, and there's, there's a, a, a modus operandi that Israel applies time and time again of, you know, buying time, wasting time, announcing investigations. These are sham investigations that no one should take seriously. We've demonstrated that by analyzing hundreds of cases over years. Uh, and yet, repeatedly, the language that is being used, you know, calling for investigation, waiting for the results of the inside investigation that no one should take, uh, should take seriously. So the reality of, of blanket impunity, and in this case, and in so many other cases, when we're even talking about American citizens, I mean, just imagine what happens. I mean, mo obviously, most of the Palestinians being killed by Israel do not have American citizenship, and everyone deserves justice and accountability, not only American citizens. But even in these cases, when we're talking about an American citizen, even in these cases, Israel succeeds in getting away with, with impunity, with the blessing uh, and the support of the US, tells you everything you need to know about the way this injustice is conducted uh, and how solid it is uh, and how um, you know, complicit US administrations are in this reality. Thank you, Haggai. And, and certainly part of what's stunning about this is the length of period in which this has been a demonstrable problem that seems to be quite obvious. Um, you know, this all of this talk about more negotiations as a way to solve this. You, you would think that we have not tried this for 30 years. And more freeing and more, more aggravating is the fact that it's not just that it's been tried, but that there's something really so structurally unjust there, that you have a situation in which somebody, you're living with somebody's boot on your neck for 30 years, and all you've ever done is say, can you please take your foot off my neck? And people say, well, 30 years of that has not been enough. Just ask, ask nicer and ask a little bit more for a little bit longer. It's obviously not going to lead to anything different, and that's that's really been um, obvious for anybody who's paying attention to what's been unfolding. Um, Zaha, if we can come to you on the question of not just the U.S. refusing to hold Israel accountable, but the U.S. in many ways rewarding Israel for bad behavior by providing special privileges for Israel, giving Israel exceptions uh, left and right, and the latest one that the Biden administration seems to be committed to is the question of Israel joining the US visa waiver program. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that program is um, and basically a little bit about the Biden effort to get Israel to join it and why Israel does not qualify for it? Sure, and uh, thanks for having me, uh, Ahmad, and uh, just wanna say how much of uh, an honor it is to be with uh, my two other co-panelists whose research and writing I, I rely on and read regularly, so um, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm thankful for um, the participation of so many of you uh, staffers out there. I can't see you, but I know you're there. Uh, thanks for, for tuning in today. So on this visa waiver program, um, we've heard very early on by President Biden um, last year that this was a very important issue to him, uh, getting Israel admitted into the visa waiver program when he met with the Israeli then Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, um, he actually raised this issue of Israel's admission to the visa waiver program. Similarly, Ambassador uh, to Israel, U.S. Ambassador to Israel Tom Nides, um, as recently as last week, talked about um, his super confidence in Israel being admitted into the visa waiver program. And when he took on the uh, ambassadorship, he made Israel's admission to the visa waiver program, one of his uh, top three priorities as um, ambassador to Israel. 
though he's not one that's a decision maker on this, it's the State Department and the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, there are certain legal requirements that Israel would have to meet. Um, so it, for me, it's difficult to understand uh, why there is so much confidence that by 2023, Israel will be admitted into the program. And some of the big three um, uh, requirements that Israel would have to meet is first, you know, that the visa denial rate um, for Israeli nationals uh, seeking entry to the U.S. would have to be under 3%. It's currently at, um, you know, 5 or 6%. In the past years, it's been 10%. And the reason why the visa denial rate is looked at is because the U.S. wants to know that, you know, if, if it's waiving visas for Israelis, that there's no there's not going to be a threat that they might actually try to stay in the U.S., that it's truly a visit. So that's the reason. Now, if we looked at the, the visa denial rate for Palestinians seeking entry to the U.S., these are these are people who are also subject to Israeli law. Um, and jurisdiction, but they have no political rights, their the waiver denial or their visa denial rate is 65%. But that doesn't get tallied in to Israel's visa denial rate. Uh, another requirement Israel has to meet is on um, the uh, sharing of information on its nationals. Uh, there have been two agreements so far that have signed, that Israel has signed, that uh, permit Israel to um, get criminal and certain intelligence information on U.S. nationals, um, criminal histories on uh, those who are seeking admission, and then uh, inquiries on particular uh, U.S. citizens, not necessarily criminal records, but uh, whether they pose a terrorist threat. This is the preventing and combating serious crime information sharing agreement that was signed just, just a few days ago. Um, this allows the exchange of biometric and biographical data on US citizens, um, allows, and you know, Israeli nationals, Israel is giving, giving this information up on its nationals as well. But it's it's um it's more than just um criminal histories. This is like you know, looking forward, whether these people pose a terrorist threat. Now, for many Palestinians. Palestinian Americans, the idea that the U.S. government would be giving up this kind of data um, on its own citizens to Israel, uh, a country that we, we know that uh, enjoys impunity with respect to its treatment of Palestinian Americans, is very problematic. But this is one of the requirements that Israel has signed these two agreements, but it still has to pass legislation um, in order to qualify, you know, in order to meet this requirement. Um, the uh, is Israel's public security minister, Omar Barlev, said uh, on the signing of the sharing uh, information sharing agreements that this will enable criminals and terrorists to be monitored and located. So I don't know exactly what this, you know, uh, this data is going to include. Uh, something that I've actually asked um, the U.S. Embassy Human Rights Officer to, to, to share with me, um, and I'm uh, waiting to hear back from her exactly on, on what what kind of information is going to be given over from um, the U.S. to Israel that's going to allow them to track Palestinian Americans um, when they travel. So with regard to the requirement of reciprocity, Israel must treat uh, U.S. nationals seeking entry through Israeli ports of entry the same as uh, the U.S. treats Israeli nationals. Reciprocity means that Israel would have to end discriminatory treatment against Muslims and Arab Americans. And, um, and this has been acknowledged and documented by the State Department that there is such discrimination and it's been longstanding and unaddressed by Israel. Um, while there were reports last year that Israel would end the practice of prohibiting Palestinian Americans holding PA IDs uh, from using Israeli uh, airports, uh, such as Ben Gurion, in fact, Israel is planning to expand discriminatory practices against Americans and other foreign um, uh, nationals visiting the occupied West Bank. So in February of this year, the military administration over the occupied territories known as the Coordinator of Government Affairs in the Territories or COGAT published a set of rules in English to make it easy for all of us that will restrict the ability of certain categories of people allowed to enter the West Bank for a visit. And the rules will completely deny anyone who does not fit into one of these categories from entering the West Bank entirely. 
The implementation of the rules is set for September 5th due to a legal challenge that, that's been filed in Israel on behalf of some Palestinian um, uh, uh, plaintiffs. Those allowed to enter the West Bank are those with first degree relatives with a Palestinian ID, journalists, business people, and investors doing work or business in the West Bank, and a limited number of students and certain researchers if you know, they are studying or teaching a subject that Israel approves of. These restrictions only apply to those students and teachers seeking to study in a Palestinian institution in the West Bank or East Jerusalem. They don't apply to Israeli universities in the occupied West Bank or Jerusalem, for example. If a traveler fits in within one of these allowed categories, they must then apply for a pre-screening before they travel 45 days in advance at an Israeli embassy or consulate abroad. The application, uh, which you can look at on the Israeli government website, requires travelers to disclose the names and ID numbers of their family members in the West Bank and the names and ID numbers of the people that they will visit and stay with in the West Bank. They also must disclose their vested and non-vested property interests there. So, if, you know, you have um, a grandmother and she might, you know, leave you some land, you, you've got to disclose that on the application. It's important to note that the approval of the application um, to COGAT is not a visa. It merely allows the traveler to board a plane or approach an Israeli land crossing. Travelers must still apply for a visa at the port of entry. Now, by having this pre-screening process at an Israeli embassy or consulate abroad, Israel is um, able to keep the number of Americans it denies entry at one of its ports um, down to a minimum. The rate of Americans deny entry and the basis for the denial would otherwise be important information for the US government to have in determining whether Israel is honoring its commitment to provide reciprocity to American travelers. And I've asked, um, I've asked various uh, US officials in the NSC and the State Department, the US security coordinator, his political advisor, about whether uh, numbers are kept of how many Americans are denied entry by Israel, both at the Allenby Crossing and at Ben Gurion Airport, and the reasons why. And they say that this information isn't isn't something they have access to or that they have on them. So it's important for policymakers to um, to demand that this kind of record keeping take place or that this kind of information be accessed from Israel, because how else would one know? if Israel's treating American citizens um, in a non-discriminatory fashion if we don't have this information um, uh, to look at. So now I have to stress that none of these rules that I just talked about apply if the traveler is planning to stay at Israeli settlement in the West Bank or they're planning to visit a settler. The rules also don't apply to anyone planning to stay in both Israel and the West Bank. Um, so the idea here, here is, is to focus on Palestinians uh, who are visiting family or those who want to study or teach at a Palestinian university. If you are just a garden variety tourist, someone who you know, went to get a bap the baptism site in Jordan and wants to go now to, to continue the pilgrimage in the Holy Land, you, wouldn't be, you don't have to worry about these rules. These, these rules aren't for you. Um, there is um, more that can be said about the treatment, uh, family reunification for spouses, children, and others seeking to join family in the West Bank, but suffice it to say that that process is extremely difficult and discriminatory. For example, someone seeking family reunification with their uh, Israeli spouse, even one residing in a West Bank settlement, does not have to face these restrictions at all. Unless, of course, they married a Palestinian ID holder, then, then there would be a whole set of other restrictions on them. But if it, an Israeli marries somebody, there's a process, there's, you know, um, there's a way to become a, a, a permanent resident or a citizen uh, through marriage. In, in uh, the occupied territories, uh, this, is not, uh, this is not an option that's very easy, um, and it it depends on the release of ID numbers by the Israeli uh, military so that that person could then get an ID and be legal, legally present in the West Bank. And this is, this is not something that happens uh, very regularly. 
Now, given the clear discriminatory treatment affecting Americans, the COGAT rules uh, are a complete disqualifier for Israel's admission into the visa waiver program. But the truth is the COGAT rules are not really new rules. They are just a repackaging of a set of written and unwritten policies and military orders that Israel has only randomly and haphazardly applied for the last 55 years since it occupied the West Bank. It's important to, you know, to give you some context here um, and understand why Israel's entry policies are so problematic. In 1967, when Israel occupied the West Bank, it stripped tens of thousands of Palestinians of their residency rights, my parents among them, when they fled the fighting or if they happened to be abroad during the Arab-Israeli war. Many of these Palestinians ended up as refugees in the United States and became US citizens, but they still have family in the occupied territories and they still own property in the West Bank. Obtaining a visitor's visa is the only way uh, these Palestinian Americans may see their family conduct business and manage their property. It's also important to note that Israel is not the sovereign over the occupied territories. That's what occupation means. It means Israel has no rights over the occupied territories. In fact, as the occupying power, Israel's job is not to change the status quo. It's required to implement existing laws for the benefit of the occupied people. Settlements and land confirmation and the service of settlement expansion are specifically prohibited under international humanitarian law. One of the things that Israel is trying to do with these COGAT rules is to control the Palestinian population growth, to restrict the entry of those persons with property rights in areas where Israel seeks to expand settlements. This is an illegal purpose. It's also racial, racially discriminatory as the rules apply only to Palestinians, Palestinian forum uh, passport holders or those seeking to be with Palestinians. So for me, the questions I have for the State Department and Department of Homeland Security are, you know, how can how can Israel possibly qualify for the visa waiver program uh, under these kinds of circumstances? And that's why it's very difficult for me to understand why, uh, you know, the highest office holders <laughs> in the U.S. believe that by 2023, just a, you know, a year from now, uh, less than a year from now, Israel is going to qualify. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Zaha. Honestly, so much, so much of what you shared. There's so much to say about all of it. It's the the, the layers of apartheid that are so blatant at this point. Um, it's just completely undeniable that it's not even a separation between Israel and the occupied territories, but within the occupied Palestinian territories, if you're visiting an illegal settlement, there's one set of rules. And if you're visiting Palestinians, it's a different set of rules. It's 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 quite clear cut. And just I want to acknowledge what you said about the State Department itself acknowledging the discriminatory policies that Israel practices that. If you're an American wanting to travel to Israel or the Palestinian territories, the State Department has a warning on their website that says, if you're Palestinian American or Arab American or American Muslim, that there is a potential that you're going to experience unequal and hostile treatment from Israeli border authorities, and you might be harassed and, and denied entry. I mean, it's, it's remarkable for our own government to be admitting to that discriminatory behavior in such a overt and blatant way, but then at the same time, turn around and try to say that Israel, somehow we can work this out and make Israel eligible for this program. It really is, in a, in a sense, um, such a dismissal of the rights of, of American citizens of Arab and Muslim and Palestinian backgrounds um, for our own government to, not to be looking out for our rights just in the service of trying to give Israel special privileges. It really is, is a situation that uh, I think most people would find unacceptable. Um, for the folks who are attending, I just want to note that the Q&A box is open. So if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please drop them in there and I can take them. Um, in the meantime, I will toss it back to Deanna just with, with a follow-up, Deanna, on um, a little bit about the extent to which not, you know, apartheid is becoming more blatant and, and Israeli politics are becoming much more plain for everyone to see as well. There isn't that pretense of, oh no, we believe in Palestinian statehood and this and that, all of that seems to be completely out of the window. And even the scale of the displacement of Palestinians now with what's happening in Masafari Atla, it's not just the occasional home here or there. There seems to be this emboldenment in Israel's behavior. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's happening in Masafari Atla and on the back of that, of what you think a shift in the US role could look like if we wanted to spell out what the U.S. policy should be in light of the way Israel is behaving, what would that actually be? 
That's a really good question, Omar. Um, you know, I think it's important to, to spell out that there is a role that the U.S. can and should be playing. It's often assumed that, that there's nothing that the U.S. can do because we see that this day-to-day -day grind of settlement construction, expansion, home demolitions, et cetera. But it's also clear that when the U.S. wants to put pressure and does put pressure, that there is a response. This is the part that's been the most frustrating is that we've seen now time and again when it's places like Masafariyata um, or Khan al-Ahmar or even the E1 plan, that, that if there is pressure that's brought to bear, there can be a change. So to look specifically at Masafariyata, we're looking at an area that's in the Southern part of the West Bank. It's home to over a thousand Palestinians. And these Palestinians have been living in um, in really awful conditions, precarious conditions for more than 30 years. Many of these families have been forced to live in houses that are, are yet connected to the electricity grid, that are yet to, to be connected to a, a water main or a water line. And, uh, and, and many of them in places where Israel has chosen to create firing zones in their areas. It's not that they came to the firing zone, it's the firing zone came to them. And, uh, and so most recently, just, uh, just uh, uh, May the 4th, I believe it was, the Israeli Supreme Court came out with a decision uh, giving, giving the green light to this mass expulsion in the area. And what's important in this is, is a few things. First is that for many, many years, Palestinians were told that, that we should be using the Israeli courts that it's the Israeli courts are somehow going to bring us some measure of relief. And for years and years and years, Palestinians and, uh, and Israeli activists and other were, others have been pushing back and saying, this isn't going to work. We know that this is a house of cards. So sure enough, with this decision that came out uh, in, on May the 4th, that it became very clear that this is a house of cards and that, that what, the, what the court is doing is it's just simply implementing exactly what the state has been pushing for. So here's where we see that now we're on, on the cusp of, of, of this death, but what I like to call death by a thousand cuts. And instead of the US administration doing anything and they do have the power to do it, instead, again, they're turning a blind eye. So it's not just in Musafariyata, it's in other places as well. It isn't just one house here, one house there, it's an entire policy of home de demolition, it's, it's entire policy of ethnic cleansing, it's an entire policy of building and expanding more settlements. Can the US do something? Absolutely. We've seen in the past when there has been pressure that pressure works, but the US has been low to put pressure on Israel. It's been low to actually um, stop Israeli action, which is why many of us say that this isn't just a question of Israel of the United States putting pressure, it's now become hand in hand, part and parcel of the machinery of ethnic cleansing. Well said and well described. Um, Haggai, if you don't mind, I'll ask you a little bit because you raised the question of accountability in general um, and how it's missing and how it's broken. You know, there's a lot of people who say that if things are not looking particularly optimistic on the US front, is that the prospect of shifting American policy towards accountability seems to be an uphill battle. What the Palestinians should be doing is going to the UN and the ICC. Um, obviously, plenty of obstacles and problems there as well. Uh, do you mind taking a stab on sort of what you see as the problem with accountability for Israeli atrocities against Palestinians more broadly, even beyond just the narrow question of, of US policy directly? Yeah, uh, maybe just before that, just to say one more thing about uh, Masafariyata and the uh, 918 continuation on what, what Diana was saying. Um, just to spell out, I mean, obviously the U.S. has leverage, and obviously if the U.S. wanted to stop any of these things, it can absolutely can do that, as it has done successfully. Uh, for instance, under the Obama administration in 2016, when Israel wanted to demolish and forcibly transfer the Palestinian community of Susia, also in the southern Hebron Hills, and eventually, belatedly, but eventually, the Obama administration put an end to that, right? And it's we can add that to the list of like, you know, it's a long list of issues that uh, the Biden administration didn't even go back to the underwhelming performance uh, 
of the Obama years, right? I mean, in some examples we already mentioned, but this is another one of them, right? During those years, we were used to seeing the top level locally based American diplomats in the field with these Palestinian communities, right? Not enough, not sufficient, but it was meaningful and sometimes it prevented forcible transfer as happened in the case of Susia. Are we even back to that? We're not, we're absolutely not. Like we have the heads of missions of like, you know, EU countries and other like-minded countries in the field, almost like week after week. And again, don't get me wrong. I don't think that's sufficient in terms of what the EU should do. The EU should apply pressure from Brussels. The EU should introduce consequences, not only send its top diplomats to the field, but the US isn't even doing that, right? Tom Knights, the US ambassador, you know, is, is missing in action in this context. And that is by design, and that is sending a very strong message to Israeli authorities as to exactly where this administration is standing as the war crime. Forcible transfer is a war crime. Israel is conducting this war crime in broad daylight. And the US is either underwriting it or turning a blind eye or both. This is where we are. Uh, so just, just to say to say that. Now, in terms of you know the odds of getting accountability for Palestinians somewhere, right, somewhere on this planet, then, you know, we circle back to Washington because the U.S. is blocking it right front and center, right, wherever it can, right? So Palestinians are, you know, desiring to seek justice from the ICC. You remember, under Trump, it was sanctions, right, against the ICC prosecutor. Uh, now, you know, these sanctions are mostly lifted, but it's not that the U.S. is now, you know, supportive of you know, international justice to be pursued by ICC, unless we're talking about Ukraine, right? So it's only like on that issue, like you know, US hypocrisy has become so so blunt uh, and so and so visible and so outrageous. Uh, and there was even you know th these reflections, quotes from you know US officials in Washington that were trying to contemplate the path for how the US can warm up its relations with the ICC because now the ICC is good because it can be used. To, against Russia, right, without getting into too much trouble with Israel, that you know doesn't want the ICC's position to be to be elevated. So that path for Palestinians is also you know blocked by to the extent that the U.S. can, uh, it tries to block that. And also at the UN, the place where you get action in the UN is the Security Council, and that's exactly the place where the U.S. applies its you know automatic veto on any meaningful resolution in the context of what's uh, what's what's you know what's happening to, to to Palestinians so washington is using its its power uh, and you know on, to be on the wrong side of history uh, to be on the side of injustice not only in the direct context of its relationship with you know israel and the palestinians but also in the multilateral arena right wherever the us can apply pressure and that's almost everywhere but just not to sound you know, too pessimistic on, on everything, I think we should acknowledge, even though this is a long process, we should acknowledge that you know, put the administration aside right, in, with all of the justified rage with regard to its international you know, policy positions in terms of where the public is, where the US public opinion is on this issue, we see that waking up. We see that that change. I wish that the path from that change to a different US foreign policy would be much faster. I know it's a trajectory and it's going to be, you know, years and years in the making, but at least we see the, that, you know, groundswell that's changing public opinion that even if elected officials are refusing to wake up to reality, the public gradually is. Thank you, Haggai. Certainly that shift in public discourse is, is very, very significant in public opinion here in the United States. Um, obviously, it's not anywhere near the point where it's going to impact policy in the immediate future, but we can certainly see the seeds of the change in Congress and in, in many places as well. And just on that note, actually, we have, uh, it's a two-part question. One is my part, and then one is a question that came in through our chat from one of our attendees. Um, sometimes uh, it's about harm reduction if it's not about complete and total accountability. And part of the harm reduction were efforts where the U.S. Congress defeated previous efforts to get Israel to join the visa waiver program, specifically because of objecting to the way 
um, many American citizens of Palestinian or Arab background are treated when they try to enter. Um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about what the climate in Congress looks like for that. And then the question that also came in from the chat is how are you advocating with political appointees at DHS and state? Sort of just all the efforts to push back on, on um, Israel joining the visa waiver program. Uh, you're muted, Zaha, if you don't mind unmuting yourself first. Why do I always do that? I will never learn. Um, I'll take the last bit first about the um, State Department and DHL. To, to their credit, what we've heard from um, officials there is that this is not a negotiation when it comes to meeting the requirements of the visa waiver program. It's, um, you know, we have, there's legal requirements and they have to be met. There's law on the subject, you know, so, so that's what we hear from the officials. But what's concerning, I guess, for, for me and for many others that are watching this is that, you know, we keep hearing high level officials say that it's just around the corner when in fact, as I mentioned earlier, there are these, um, there's a expansion of discriminatory practices and we have recognition you know, and consensus uh, in the legal community, international legal community of, of the fact that this is an apartheid situation. And there can be no, there can be no um, uh, uh, fair treatment for American citizens of Palestinian ancestry or any other Palestinian foreign passport holder in this context. So unless there's going to be, you know, a change in the complete uh, regime that Israel's constructed in the occupied territories, you know, I don't see how people can be so confident and to use Ambassador Nide's words, super confident <laughs> that we're going to have Israel admitted in 2023. Um, and then on the how Congress is is um, thinking about this, I mean, we've we've seen many letters now. I, I think it's three or four. Some that were sign on letters from Congress to the State Department, and some that were individual letters um, to the State Department from members of Congress talking about this issue of the visa waiver, not necessarily. Uh, the visa waiver program in connection to uh, the COGAT rules, but questioning the COGAT rules and the, and the discriminatory, discriminatory treatment of particular classes of people. There was a letter on the um, issue of uh, academics and um, students who are trying to, uh, you know, study in Palestine or teach in Palestine. There's, you know, we, there's quotas around the number of students per, you know, uh, at, at a time that can be inside the West Bank for study and their limits to only one um, semester. There's quota around the number of uh, professors that can teach and what they can teach. And so there was a letter from uh, Representative Jamal Bowman and, and others, uh, you know, about particular this issue. And then there was letters from Rashida Tlaib that focused on the impacts on Palestinian Americans in particular um, and, and how they're treated. Now, she's a member of Congress who was denied entry because of her um, advocacy uh, for the use of nonviolent tools to, you know, to challenge Israel's occupation. This is a member of Congress, the member of Congress, Palestinian American and denied entry because of her uh, political speech and, do, and, you know, and, and trying to engage uh, in her official capacity and fact-finding with other members of Congress and, and uh, she was denied entry. So in this space, it's hard to imagine how um, Israel uh, qualifies for, um, for uh, admission. Think about this. I mean, if you're, if you're an American visiting a Palestinian living in, in the West Bank, you can only use the Allenby land crossing with Jordan. You can only travel through Jordan to go see that person. You're not allowed to use an Israeli airport. <laughs> and you're an American citizen. You just happen, the ethnic identity of the person that you're visiting happens to be Palestinian. And so for that reason, you're not allowed to use the airport. Now, what possible security justification could there be for that? I mean, you can only explain it if you're, if you're you know, thinking about the, uh, you know, the context of Israel's apartheid over, over the occupied territories. And then it, you know, then you understand. So how can, how can there be um, uh, Israel's, how can Israel possibly meet the, the criteria for, for entry? 
Omar, if I if I may just jump in, uh, just to, to, to just like to, to I mean to just express again like the like the outrage, but also like to to hope that you know people are, like will be able to you know, really like directly grasp the way this is you know part of the system, right? That like how racist and arrogant like Israel's attitude towards Palestinians is any Palestinian, right? It doesn't matter if you're a US citizen. It doesn't matter if you're a member of Congress. What matters is whether you're a Palestinian or not. And if you are Palestinian, then you will be treated the way Israel's apartheid system treats Palestinians anywhere, right? And because in the reality here, in the one state reality, Israel also controls the envelope and has full control over who comes in and who can go out, then that is also expressed in the context of freedom to travel. And again, doesn't matter what your capacity, what your formal reality, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is this binary question, are you a Palestinian or not? Absolutely. And it, Zaha, you reminded me when you were talking about the denial of entry for Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. Again, we're talking about a country that denies entry for US members of Congress because they express opinions that Israel does not like. And to think that they would be admitted into the visa waiver program, it just, it's, it's, it's really mind boggling. Um, we have a question in our chat that came from Beth. Um, it says, could you speak a bit about what's a, what a possible normalization agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia specifically would mean for Palestinians and for people like Yemenis and others who are harmed by Saudi Arabia's policies? Um, I'll have this open-ended for whoever would like to take a stab at it. Diana, you look like you want to jump in. You're muted though. Yeah, no, it's okay. I was waiting for the other two. Um, look, I think it's important to put the normalization also in a in a, a bit of a different light. It's easy for people to assume that somehow the Arab world is normalizing with Israel, but it's not. These are really just regimes that are normalizing. They're not people who are normalizing with Israel. And the reason that this is important is because as much as Israel and is trying to sell itself and as much as the US is trying to sell Israel, people aren't buying it in the Arab world at all. For example, if you look at um, just Jordan and, and Egypt, two countries that have had peace agreements with Israel for decades, there's, there's still no warm peace between those countries at all nor will there ever be provided that Israel continues to deny Palestinians their freedom. So when it comes to the UAE and Bahrain and other countries and potentially Saudi Arabia, what the US is doing is they're trying to normalize the country, but they're not normalizing the region. And that there's a big difference between the two issues. Before it used to be that the, I, that for Israel, the idea was that normalization would come through the end of occupation by denying, by ending the denial of freedom. And now, of course, it's getting that. But it still doesn't mean that there is acceptance in the Arab world, nor will there ever be acceptance in the Arab world, provided that Israel continues to not to deny Palestinians their freedom. We saw this particularly come to the fore two months ago. With, with the murder of Shirin Abu Akhle. For as much as, the, as we were being told that the Arab world has forgotten us, they've forgotten Palestinians, they've moved on, we saw exactly this outpouring of love and support for Shirin because of what she did, which is she brought Palestine to the Arab world. So what does normalization look like? It looks like the same type of normalization that we see with Egypt, that we see with Jordan, in which there's a phone call here, a phone call there. There's a lot of security collaboration that happens between the two. There's a lot of uh, selling of weaponry. In the case of the UAE, there's probably a little bit more business that's happening, but it's not beyond that. And that's the part that is, is really important for people to understand. So while it's tragic for me, and I certainly don't wanna see it because I don't believe that Israel should be rewarded. I actually think that it should be getting the sticks and, and not the carrots. Um, at the end of the day, this type of normalization has been going on for quite some time. And it actually just shows how, how bankrupt US foreign policy is, that that's all that they can do. All that they can do is 
is push forward with uh, more and more empty policies that don't seek to actually create peace. They just seek, seek to somehow manage conflict and not actually end it. Thank you, Diana. Um, we have a question that came in from our attendees as well. Uh, can you talk about the not so secret secret Israeli nuclear program and its impact on US Israeli relations in the context of President Biden's trip? Now, I don't imagine that that probably factors too much into this Biden trip particularly, but if anybody would like to talk about that program in general and sort of the US double standard on that also feel free to. I don't know if Hagai you would like to weigh in on this one. It's not an issue that Bitsalem works on. It is worth noting, though, the remarkable way that you have Israeli leaders talking about the Iranian nuclear program um, and the way the United States talks about the, pro the prospect of nuclear proliferation in the region. Meanwhile, the one country in the region that does have nuclear weapons, it's always off the table and not part of the discussion. It's, it's, uh, that's also been um, one of the many ways as we're talking about the visa waiver program and exceptional military aid and the list goes on just the ways in which it's quite interesting that sometimes critics um, people who defend israeli policies talk about israel being held to double standards and the answer is yes israel is held to double standards but not in punishment it's actually in being privileged and treated like it's above the law so i think that's that's probably worth mentioning as well are there any other questions if folks would like to weigh in just feel free we have just a few more minutes left um, if there are any more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I have one more that came in. Give me one second. There it is. Um, it's clear that Biden has failed Palestinians time and again with broken promises. What would it look like for the U.S. to hold Israel accountable? And what would that mean for Palestinians? Um, I'll also have jump that. In. <laughs> <laughs> one more time. Zaha, I missed it. I can, I can jump in uh, Please do. on, on Please this do. Um, and really quickly. So we can just do a round robin on it. <laughs> I mean, for me, first priority is, you know, US do no harm. I mean, don't be complicit and don't be, you know, don't be funding home demolitions and um, settlement expansion and don't be providing political cover to uh, Israel at, uh, you know, the UN uh, and joining the UN Human Rights uh, council just to protect Israel from inordinate attention. I, it really struck me uh, when we were just days into the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and Secretary of State Blinken uh, spoke at the UN uh, Human Rights Council to say, you know, that the council needs to stop putting so much attention on Israel. And then, you know, a few breaths later, he was saying that there needs to be accountability <laughs> for the Russian occupation of um, Ukraine. It's that kind of, uh, you know, odd, uh, contradictory foreign policy that makes the U.S. so non-credible. But more than that, it, it's what's facilitating and allowing the perpetuation of the human rights abuses um, on the ground. And it's making the U.S. not just morally responsible, you know, at some point legally responsible too, because the U.S. is so complicit and and now we're entering a new phase in which the U.S. is going to be heavily investing in, you know, uh, civil society uh, normalization and regional economic integration that involves uh, blurring distinctions between Israel and the occupied territories. So then the U.S. becomes a financier and, a, and an investor um, in, in this as well. So for me, the first step is like, stop what you're doing <laughs> and, and don't be complicit. And um, uh, and the human rights abuses. Thank you. Zaha. Anybody else would like to jump in on this? Maybe just just quickly, and as as, also as closing remarks, just to say that uh, like I wanted, I, I'm, we're we're speaking to congressional staffers, and and, and I wanted to talk to people's sense of uh, I don't know disappointment, outrage, humiliation. Like, I mean, promises were made, right? Like this was a major campaign theme, like aligning US foreign policy with a genuine commitment to human rights. I remember like, you know, Secretary Blinken's first speech, right, the Secretary of State, like promises were made, right? And yet here we are, uh, and the US is, you know, flagrantly, flagrantly, like continue to underwrite, like everything that's been, you know, playing out 
since you know Biden was was elected, including you know unprecedented developments. And I mean, as if everything that came before wasn't horrific enough, then you know everything that we discussed you know during this call and and, and so many other things, right? And the U.S. is complicit. And there, it, there's always an excuse, right? Like we all know it by heart, right? So the excuse before was that, you know, the government in Jerusalem shouldn't be pressured because it would collapse and then, you know, Netanyahu would be back. But if the policies are implemented anyway, are the same policies, then what difference does it make, right? And then the government collapses. So now there's a new excuse not to pressure the government because, you know, it's just a caretaker government and so on. But I'm old enough to remember that apparently in Washington, it's never the right time to pressure Israel to actually stop oppressing Palestinians, right? There's always an excuse. So because we you know, remember that and we know that, we understand that these are just excuses. And in fact, you know, the, the talk about you know, justice, freedom, uh, equal measures, right? Of freedom and dignity, like that's the new, the new language from Washington. What, where, where are the receipts? Like what has the US done to back that language, right? We see the receipts in the opposite direction all, all, all the time. So, I, I think this deep sense of resentment and, and, and disappointment by people that have, you know, believed in good faith the promises that that were made. Uh, but I, but I'm confident that you know, the demand for change will continue, and sadly, the U.S. will remain on the wrong side of history on this issue for quite some time. By the way, exactly in the same way it was on the wrong side of history in supporting apartheid South Africa until, you know, almost like the very last minute when finally, like, you know, the public outrage forced the, the, the administration to change, to change course. Th that day will come. I just hope it's going to come sooner than later. And that's ultimately seems to be the contrast in approaches between the belief that you can coddle Israel into behaving better one day, despite a very lengthy track record of not that not being the case between US policy and normalization efforts, versus efforts like the BDS movement, which is, you know, same as in South Africa, it was about isolating somebody who engages in really severe forms of oppression, um, in order for them to know that, you know, to under pressure decide to behave better. And that certainly has been the approach that has never been tried. Um, by any government so far, any major government, any major player, and a change in that direction in terms of US policy obviously would potentially be a very, very significant game changer. Um, on that note, it is now exactly one hour, so I think we may just leave it at that. Um, thank you for everybody who attended this. Uh, a recording of this is going to be available afterwards. Um, and so yeah, please just visit IMEU's platforms and you'll be able to see it there. So once again, thank you to Diana, Hagai, and Zaha very, very much for making time to be with us today. This has been a very, very interesting and insightful conversation. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.